I do always like to start off the show with a summary of kind of what we saw happening this week in the market. Uh, actually, this has been three weeks so altogether yes. since our last show. Had a couple weeks off here. Um, and uh, kind of interesting, actually not a lot has moved. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot has happened. Uh, but if you look at the last three weeks there on the S&P 500, kind of in the same place. And actually, one of the things that's quite interesting, uh, I think we're right about where we were at the very beginning of last May. Uh, and so almost a year of sideways motion here mm -hmm. altogether with a really big range. I mean, it's about a 20% range from high to low. You know, the stock market averages 11% a year. So that's a big range uh, uh, to kind of end up in the same spot. Uh, lots of things have happened. But if we look at this in totality, we can see, you know, starting at the top back there at the end of uh, beginning of 2022, uh, you know, we had several big run-ups, uh, all of which ended up lower than the previous run-up connected somewhat so by that red line and then finally this year we broke through that red line mm -hmm. we set up a new high then we came back down and challenged the low that we'd hit before uh came through the red line a little bit and then came back up and so what's significant about right now is that really in a technical sense we should be kind of breaking up into another new high uh, and we're really struggling to do so. Uh, having a good day today, but overall kind of a, you know, a downward week as far as that goes. And uh, really there's a couple things that I think are going to put a top or a hat or whatever you want to call it, resistance on this market running up a lot. Uh, the first of all, of course, and we'll talk about this more, but is the debt ceiling, you know, mm -hmm. argument. Uh, you know, this week we had Janet Yellen coming out saying that, you know, we're going to run out of money on June 1st. Uh, that's a lot earlier than was expected. Uh, we've been told before, maybe end of June to the end of the summer uh, type of thing. Uh, so June 1st is you know not very far away. <laughs> so that kind of created some problems with the market. And of course, now we've had some uh, continuation of issues with the banking arena. And of course, you know last week we really had the First Republic Bank uh, is now going to be absorbed by J.P. Morgan Chase. Uh, and then this week it's PacWest, AmeriWest, America. Uh, Bank Corp and uh, First National, yep. et cetera. Uh, and so, you know, we've got this situation where uh, I think the banking situation is important in the sense that uh, originally we heard about several banks and all of those have been resolved in one way or another. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the last one was First Republic. Okay, so maybe it's done. It's confined. Uh, we have Chairman Powell with the Federal Reserve coming out this Wednesday saying, hey, uh, you know, banking system is very sound. It looks good. And then right after that, we start hearing about these other banks. Uh, and, you know, they've had big drops in their prices. Uh, today, they're up a lot. Yeah. But it's kind of, <laughs> kind of crazy. Uh, so if you're trading in regional bank stocks, you're having a heck of a roller coaster ride. Uh, so I think uh, uh, PacWest was down like 40-some percent and then 30-some percent. And now it's back up 80-some percent today. Uh, you know, just kind of so wild. So way below. It's like... A normal oh yeah and, and it should be you know uh i i mentioned this before but pac west um you know reported earnings i believe it was last week uh, and they were well received stock went up uh you know deposits were up for the month and all these things uh, and then this week it was reported uh, in bloomberg that they were pursuing a sale lots of reasons you might do a sale but in this particular environment anything uh, is seen as you know possible negatives, and that's what started the whole thing. And all of a sudden, we're looking at all these other banks at the same time. So, it's a little hard to tell for sure what's happening. But one thing that is certain is that when a fear of a bank having problems come into play, all of a sudden you can have kind of a run on that bank. And in today's world, a run on the bank is digital. It happens very quickly. Literally within a matter of minutes, a bank can have so much deposits leave that they don't have the capital to re to do that. I mean, everybody kind of knows this, but you give the money to a bank and they put it somewhere else. It's usually not that liquid. It could be in a 30-year mortgage or, uh, you know, those types of things. And so trying to get that money back quickly to give back to depositors can be a challenge, right? Yeah, um, it takes seconds. Like I can just go to my bank account, put in a new routing number, and the money's out. Yeah, they actually have services for some of these big companies where, you know, they guarantee they can get the money out in a couple of minutes and those types of things. So this is a new arena that's really going to be difficult to deal with on a regulatory basis. Uh, and it's and it's kind of wild uh, as far as that goes. Uh, and 
So anyway, you can have a fairly sound bank that all of a sudden has a lot of deposits leaving quickly due to a rumor or something that you're trying to do that's fairly legitimate. Uh, the, the overall banking system that is supposedly sound, according to Jay Powell, would definitely be the large banks. They yeah. seem to be doing pretty well. As a matter of fact, J.P. Morgan Chase just is going to be absorbing, you know, First Republic Bank. It kind of shows you, you know, who's out there. PNC was in the running for that, so we'll assume that they've got some decent, you know. Uh, yeah, and because most of these major banks, they've gone to a size where usually with antitrust, they can't get any bigger with a by acquiring firms. So this is kind of like a fire sale for them. That's right. This is where they kind of bypass that antitrust to allow this to happen in this particular environment. Now, in the 2008 crisis, uh, they did put into place some rules where the big banks have to have more money on hand than the regional banks. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of creating a problem right now. And of course, uh, you know, the big banks are probably getting a lot of this money. We've seen several headlines for some of this money and where it's going. And one of the things that's very fascinating is that the bank itself uh, it really is kind of revolving around how much money it has that's not insured, mm -hmm. right? And so uh, I know reading an article about Silicon Valley National Bank, or Silicon Valley Bank, sorry, that uh, they had 94% of their assets were uninsured, over 250000 for for that depositor. What well, sounds okay, except for the fact that the the more likely to have a run on your bank when it starts to have problems, if you had, you know, five million there versus, you know, fifty thousand, yep. you're gonna maybe move that. So the uh, more a bank has over and above the insured amount, the more risk it has of having a run on the bank. Uh, and so that's one of the things that's now being kind of looked at within all of these banks. So it's it's really a, a fascinating arena. So lots of other things are happening though, and there's some really good things. I do think that the banking and the debt ceiling situation. Uh, and I'll, I'll add the Federal Reserve pausing on rates. Okay, those three things have to happen here for the market to really take off. Mm -hmm. uh, and the banking situation is probably the you know very unclear as to how that's going to be taken care of. I will say uh, you got to be re real careful of getting super cautious in these environments because if the government steps in, they can backstop these banks. Uh, and basically take care of this situation on Monday. Uh, you know, it's hard to say what's going to happen. All of a sudden, the market's moving up really rapidly because of that. Uh, and so um, altogether, that's something to be aware of uh, just as far as that goes. Now, our current signals for this week are for the stock market. Uh, we are at yellow on the fast signal, and we, we made some uh, conservative moves yesterday. Uh, on our IRA type of assets. So yellow just means we're still in the market for the most part, just using things that have lower standard deviation, a little bit lower risk. Um, so if the market does continue down, you know, we'll, you know, go down less would be the idea. And if it goes up, we'll go up, sometimes go up less, but we're just pulling back a little bit of the risk of the portfolio. We're still green on the on the slow signal, which just means that our taxable accounts are still kind of out there, you know, participating in the market. Uh, we try to, you know, reduce transactions in those taxable accounts because they have to be put on the tax returns. And uh, sometimes there's a gain in there, so we have to be careful. Now, our bond market signals are currently both green. Uh, and so, again, um, that's not unusual in an environment like this. The Federal Reserve has talked about the possibility, or at least Jay Powell hinted at the possibility of pausing rates at the mm -hmm. next meeting, you know, those type of things. And we'll talk about that. That's a, a situation the bond market likes in terms of the price moving up. And so we've seen some some stability in that arena, which ironically could actually help the banks. Yep. Uh, you know, the bond market recovering in price would help the banks at this point in time, uh, just because that's one of the big problems that they've had here as far as that goes. So let's take a look at some of the other things that are happening here, which I think are interesting. Uh, so first of all, we have the uh, non-farm payroll. So this is just how many employees are out there working right now. So mm -hmm. today is the employment report day uh, for last month. Uh, we had a lot more jobs added than expected. Um, although, ironically, they went back and adjusted the last two months down quite a bit. Yep. Makes me wonder a little bit about what this number really is. We'll find out maybe in a few months. Um, however, if you look at that, you can see the huge job loss, about 15 million jobs uh, during the pandemic. Uh, 
Uh, but we are now above where we were in terms of the pandemic, which is a good sign. Uh, so the, the, the labor market is doing quite well. And this is the unemployment rate. Now I'm actually showing you a really long-term uh, you know, view of this going back to 1948. Uh, today's unemployment report was reported at 3.4 percent. Yep. The last time we were at 3.4 percent was 1969, a long time ago. We weren't there that long. Uh, the time before that was, you know, back in the uh, late 50s. So it's it, this is a really, really low unemployment rate. Again, showing kind of the strength of the market. And and this is kind of a weird good thing is that the number of job openings has actually come down some because. What happened was that the number of job openings was so high compared to the number of people looking for work, we saw wages just kind of skyrocketing, which is a very heavy inflationary environment to be in. And we're starting to see some drop off. We're still at record levels, essentially, at 1.6 jobs open right now for each person that's looking for a job. But it was closer to two. But as that comes down, that kind of takes some of the pressure off and we start to see, uh, you know, hourly earnings are jumped a little bit this last month. But if you look at the trend here over the last year, it's at 4.4%, 4.5% increase. And again, if I have a job, I want to see that increasing as fast as possible. If I have investments, I want to see that being somewhat moderated because this is what can drive inflation, which makes the Federal Reserve go crazy on raising mm -hmm. rates which causes bank problems, which will cause other problems, right? And so it's this cascade. So, but this is a good trend altogether. You know, the wage rate is staying in a moderate range. It's not getting out of control, even though we have a lot of job openings and what have you too. Uh, and then the participation rate, which is very important. If, if, you, if you have a lot of job openings and nobody wants to come out to get them, you're gonna have to spend a lot of money trying to compete for those few people that are trying to get yep. them. And so the, the participation rate is the number of people that can work, uh, how many of those are working. So it's at 62.6% right now. Um, and the main thing there is trend, right? We're mm -hmm. not back to where we were participation wise before the pandemic started, you can see that. But we're continuously moving upward there, and we moved up somewhat today also. So. Yeah, it seems a lot of people more as pandemic is essentially considered over now. Yeah. Um, they're coming back to the workforce. Child care is a lot easier, and everything's going well. Yeah, exactly. Kids are back at school. Uh, they might have burned through any money that they did save during that period of time. Things cost more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a lot of job openings, right? So. There, we're getting a lot of people back into the workforce. We've still got a ways to go to get the full participation back up, but it, but it is getting there. So these are all really good things. And this is what, during the uh, conference for the Federal Reserve, uh, they always announced, you know, hey, we did a quarter point increase. Here's what we see. They took some wording and changed it to basically saying, you know, instead of saying we anticipate future increases, is we're going to evaluate whether we should have future increases. I'm paraphrasing. But... It's, it, it is significant, and actually Jay Powell pointed to that part of the statement a few times, but he also said that he doesn't feel like we're going to have a recession. That's his outlook. He feels like, as he said, he's maybe in the minority there a little bit, but he thinks that what I'm showing you as positive here, this mm -hmm. job market and the labor market, combined with the demand, the pent-up demand and people spending money, is going to offset the increases in rates, the banking problems that are going to cause banks to cut back on lending and those types of things. And that we have a we have a chance of kind of coming down the middle, you know, in kind of this soft landing arena. Uh, so uh, anyway, we'll see how that plays out. I hope he's right, because that would be perfect and the market would really like that, especially once they stop raising rates, once the banking situation gets under control, and once the debt ceiling's done, th this market could pop because there's just so many good things. Here's Here's what they're looking at, all right? So I'm putting up the consumer price index. Here's core inflation, right? And so you can see that that's been a little sticky. This is the last three years, jumped way up. And this is one of the numbers that they're focused on. So CPI is a basket of goods. Mm -hmm. And that basket has had food and energy removed. They call that core. And that's what the Fed tends to look at more often. Uh, and they especially look at this next chart, which is PCE, yep. Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, at 4.6%. Jay Powell talked about this during the conference. Uh, that needs to be at 2, right? That's what they're trying to get at 2. And you can see there's a slight motion downward here, but not enough. 
So it's still sticking up there. And this is why they did the quarter point increase, right? Uh, one thing, though, if you look past that, and they talked about this also, the PPI index. This is the producer price index. So this is kind of wholesale prices. Mm -hmm. Now look at that. That's a much different looking chart. So this could be and most likely is a precursor to inflation for those two previous charts. Yep. So if we see faster decreases on the wholesale side, eventually that comes through as uh, decreases on the consumer side. It just takes a while. There are some margins that are probably being made there, but then yep. competitive pressures kick in and companies start to uh, not maybe not cut costs per se, uh, maybe on some things, but not across the board, but just start to increase costs at a slower rate. Um, yeah, and then demand also, as prices keep going up, demand slowly stagnates away. Yeah, exactly. And so so that's that that that's good. Inflation is likely coming down, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it's going in the right direction. Let's put it that way. Uh, we have the employment situation is really, really strong, right? Both of those. We are now, you know, I think 90% uh, of the companies on the S&P 500 or 85% have reported so far for this particular quarter, uh, and almost 80% of those companies have uh, beaten expectations. Is right? that kind of the baseline percentage usually? It's higher than the average, okay. higher than the five-year average. Now, the the amount of how much they beat, because uh, uh, it's, it's about 7% higher than the expectations, uh, that's a little bit lower, uh, but the number of beats is higher. So what's happening is that Wall Street is kind of looking at all these situations and really ratcheting down expectations. As those expectations come down, that affects the stock market. And then as they report, they're beating those expectations, uh, you know, and they weren't supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not kidding. I mean, if you look at what was reportedly going to happen in the fourth quarter, first quarter, that hasn't transpired. I mean, it really hasn't. Uh, and that's why the market is still hanging up there, in my opinion. Um, so this last chart is just the Fed funds futures market. This is where the futures market is betting on where the Fed funds will be, right? And so right now the Fed funds is at five to five and a quarter, a little bit of a range that they use all the time. They just, that was with the quarter point increase. And if you look closely at this, it's saying by January, we're gonna, of next year, we're gonna be at 4.3%, which is about a three quarter to 1% drop from where we are now. Uh, and you can see actually prior, we had a huge run up. See, yeah. big run up. Now that was at the beginning of the year. If you recall, we had some really hot numbers come out from retail sales uh, and from the job reports that were coming. And the market started anticipating, you know, oh, the Fed's going to have to fight this. Maybe we're going to go to 6% and what have you. And then Silicon Valley Bank went out of business and, and all these other banks started to come through. And that's that big cliff that we're looking at just, you know, right there. Now, what's happening is that the market is saying, hey, you're going to be lowering rates. And as of yesterday, when those other banks had problems, uh, the lowering has now moved into high probability by July, <laughs> by the July meeting, uh, and actually a 25% chance that they would actually reduce rates by the June meeting. Mm. And again, this is anticipation of having more problems with the banks and those problems continuing to create other problems. Sometimes that's not true because the government steps in and backstops these and does different things. So we'll have to see how that plays out. But it would be kind of fascinating. They raise rates here in May and then they lower them again and in, in starting in you know June. Now, one thing to keep in mind here, what the market is telling us right here with this is that there's an expectation for a recession. Mm -hmm. That's why they lower rates, right? And so a recession would bring down prices. Inflation should fall in a recessionary environment, theoretically. And we would have, you know, lower rates while the Federal Reserve tries to support things like, you know, a, a banking crisis from getting bigger or whatever it might be. And so that's what's really fascinating to me. Now, one thing to keep in mind is the stock market is operating on the next cycle. So once they start lowering rates in anticipation or in middle of a recession, the stock market often does quite well. Mm -hmm. I remember my grandmother asking me once, she said, why is the stock market going up when unemployment's going up and you know jobs are being lost and those types of things? It's because the market's looking at the next cycle, which would be an upward cycle, right? We've already had this big drop. We had a 28% drop from high to low you know, from uh, last year. And in anticipation of this recession that we're still talking about today. Now, the problem is, 
in the question and answer session, they asked Chairman Powell, do you expect rates to be coming down? The market expects rates to mm -hmm. be coming down this year. And he said, no. <laughs> and he said no last time also. And the market responded negatively to that. And this is one of the fears is that, you know, the market sees things that maybe the Federal Reserve doesn't. And we're going to have to find out who's right here as far as that goes. Usually the market is more correct. And Jay Powell might be changing his mind on, you know, lowering rates at some point in time. But again, his outlook is that we're not going to have a recession because the combine, the combined forces of good versus bad are evening out each other, which is true right now. Uh, but what the market is seeing is that that bad could get worse here, especially with this banking problem, right? So that that's what we're playing with right now. Very, very fascinating time frame. Uh, I think it's a good time to be yellow. Again, we don't respond to all this news and the debt ceiling issues and those types. We respond to looking at the market and evaluating what the market is doing and looking at the price movement of the market and responding to that because there are things that we don't know about that are out there that are probably already somewhat factored into the price. And there are a lot of things that we're talking about that might turn out to be nothing, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why you just kind of respond to that. So again, I do think it's not a bad time to have a, a little bit of a, a yellow light here uh, just because of what I'm seeing with the price. You know, we didn't break into a new high. We kind of broke down when we got to the previous high. Uh, and that's important. Today's up, so maybe things maybe things improve. All right, so that's our summary. Uh, again, a little bit longer than usual, but it's kind of been three weeks since we talked last. I think that it's really an important time frame. You can learn a lot by what's happening here and learn a lot about you know how to manage money here also. So uh, thank you for joining us for this summary, and we'll look forward to doing the next one next week too.